Hi, my name is Tim Shepard, and I've come to this conference hoping to find some other people who might be interested in working with me or helping me or giving me advice on this project I've been working on for, well, a while now. Um, I titled the talk, Reducing Latency in the Linux Wireless Network Drivers. Uh, the term buffer bloat has been quite um, well known for the past few years with um, FQ Codel and um, the drive to get the latency out of the, um, the bloating queues in the middle of the network. And I've, oops, sorry. Um, how do I move on? There we go. So several years ago, things got better if you're willing to replace the queue disk in your Linux with FQ Codel. Actually, do you, does everybody here already familiar with the buffer bloat problem? Who is not familiar with buffer bloat? So at least one. See if I can explain it concisely. TCP fills the queue at the bottleneck. If you have a path and there's one link on the, on the path, which is the slowest link, the queue that's in front of that link, the way TCP works, it tends to put a packet in the network when a net packet comes out of the network, and TCP will tend to fill up that bottleneck. And this was not a problem for perhaps several decades in the internet until people started using the internet for more interactive things and things like voice over IP, uh, where they care more about the latency. And um, I think five, six years ago, um, a lot of attention started getting paid to the, um, this problem of increased latency in bottleneck queues when there are people using them for bulk transfer, therefore they have TCPs that are filling them up, and also attempting to use them simultaneously for services where they care about the latency and wanting low latency. Things like voice over IP or simply any kind of interactive traffic, gaming, or simply web browsing where you care how fast your DNS looks, lookups are happening. Sometimes DNS lookups can take several round trip times to complete, and if your resolver is behind a link that is, um, has been bloated up by bulk transfers, bulk TCP transfers, it, if it's gonna take several round trips, but that round trip that might have been five or 10 milliseconds has turned into a half second, you suddenly find yourself with multiple second latencies before you even find out you can get the domain name resolution um, for example, or any, any, any service where you care about the latency. So um, Van Jacobson invented Codel, which got a lot of attention. It was sort of the first AQM that didn't require um, careful tuning. Earlier we had had something called RED, random early detection, which attempted to drop packets to um, signal TCPs earlier that they need to back off so that they wouldn't completely fill up the buffer. But that wasn't ter terribly successful. Codel was a much better option. And then Codel got implemented for Linux as a QDisk, so you can replace it, replace the default P50 fast QDisk on your Linux with Codel. And then FQ Codel was invented, was developed shortly after that. And um, besides applying the Codel algorithm to reduce, to push back on the TCPs and convince them to not keep the, that buffer at the bottleneck full, uh, FQ Codel hashes the flows into multiple uh, buckets and then services the buckets round robin. So even if one TCP flow is in fact building a standing queue, hopefully you hash into a different bucket and you will see sort of at most one round robin from all the flows going through that um, device. So if you can replace, there's the command if you want to do it interactively, you replace the um, queue disk on the bottleneck link on your path. Um, you find that the, the internet seems zippier and um, 
the latency has come down. And, um, and the problem was solved. So lots of people thought, and I thought. Um, but then there became, it started to become more, more common that um, there were situations where the wireless link on the path was, is the, um, bottleneck. And in fact, my friend Andrew McGregor left his job at a, in New Zealand and took a job in Sydney, Australia, working for Google, and quickly found a temporary apartment uh, and moved in somewhere near the office. Uh, I think, or actually might have had a one-year lease. Anyway, he found himself in an apartment planning to get the, the only internet service that was available in that building was DSL. And so he quickly then put in, once he moved in, put in the order for the DSL service and they came out to install it several times and eventually told him, sorry, there are no more pairs left into your building, we can't offer you service. And he had no alternatives to get internet, internet at home other than the fact that having just worked, uh, taken a job for Google, uh, somebody handed him a Nexus 5, which was kind of new then and he had great high-speed LTE service on his Nexus 5, and he, ha and he can share the Wi-Fi link. He can share his LTE service to his laptop using the um, access point service on his Nexus 5. And, um, so that, and so there he was. Well, he had come from, he had been involved in some of the FQ Codel work. He wasn't one of the primary contributors, but he had certainly been involved and talking with all the people who had made that happen and uh, got it into Sarah Wirt and then Open Wirt. Uh, and he had been an earlier adopter of configuring those sites. And so at his apartment and I believe his parents' house uh, in New Zealand, they had very low latency. You know, everything, FQ Codel and all the links, and they even did the hack where you can't fix the. Um, bottleneck link at your ISP that's feeding your DSL line. So you actually created a smaller, a slightly smaller bottleneck that's in your house so that that's where the queue will build up and then you can control it, control that with FQ Codel. And he had very um, low latency internet browsing even over his DSL line in New Zealand and then he moves to Australia and is now in an apartment and is stuck using his phone and discovers that the wireless driver on his Nexus 5 is badly bloated. Now normally you wouldn't care about the wireless drivers necessarily having a buffer bloat problem because it's normally not the bottleneck. Usually, um, but in, in, in that case he did. And then at some point he realized he works for Google now. And he says, well, Android, Nexus 5 is a Google thing and Android is a Google thing. You can get out, he works for Google, he gets complete access to the employee directory of Google. He figured out who the right people were at Android and says, I just need to go explain to them the problem. And his head was full of ideas about what needed to be done to fix this uh, wireless buffer bloat problem. It's complicated, but his head was full of ideas. He didn't have time to work on it, but he figured, ah, I just need to explain to the Android folks what the problem is and they'll fix it. And indeed, he was successful. He managed to get an appointment to go visit them in California. He went and sat in their office for a while, told them the whole story about buffer bloat, told them what the problem with the wireless driver was, explained it all to them. And if I remember, I'm, he told me the story quite a while ago, but my memory of him telling the story, so this is becoming sort of legend as the story gets retold, is that they thanked him very much for explaining the problem to him. He thought it was great that he had figured all this out. And they were very interested in knowing when he got it fixed and when the patches were upstream so that they could pull the patches and that they would definitely do that. <laughs> Oops. He was hoping to plant the ball firmly in their court, and they very firmly put it back in his court. I'm sorry? Apparently he didn't talk to the right guys. 
the right guys there? Yeah, I'm working on Wi-Fi driver for Nexus 5, and I, do, I don't know what you're talking about, so... Well, maybe he did <laughs> <laughs> Were you there two years ago? Yes. That's great. I'm glad I came and told that story, so... I, and put you in touch with Andrew and, Nate, and maybe me, we can have a... That's, that's really great. What's your name? Dimitri. Dimitri. I'll have to find you later. So he was scratching his head, okay, how do I find, how do I get this fixed? I'm not going to be able to do it. So he, so he, he eventually, about, I think about six months after that, I, I was, um, or sometime in the next half year, I was actually looking for the next gig. And he said, hey, would you be interested in working on this? I was like, oh, okay, maybe. So he talked me into working on this. And another example of some place that cares, but well, it took him a while to figure out, um, he eventually figured out he should try to figure out how to send some of Google's money my way. And he tried to figure out how to, um, if, you know, Google has funded some open source work in the past and he thought maybe he could get that. That turned out to be just complicated and difficult, Google's a place. But he eventually introduced me to, uh, to some folks at Google Fiber, in particular Avery Pinneran, who just walked in the room. And Google Fiber has a similar situation. I mentioned earlier, normally the wireless link isn't the bottleneck on the path. But Google Fiber, uh, where they have service, like they're not in my neighborhood yet, unfortunately. Um, but when, where, they're, where they offer service, they bring in gigabit ethernet, or gigabit service, which winds up on gigabit ethernet in your house. And, um, and then if you're using, and, you know, they, they're providing the fastest wireless access points that they can, but they still tend to be the bottleneck. So again, once again, the wireless driver is driving the bottleneck link on the path, and now um, buffer bloat matters. So uh, they were interested in this as well. They were interested in other stuff, and I wound up um, getting to talk with the folks at Google Fiber often about a bunch of stuff. So we finally got around to actually trying to tackle this specific problem, um, I think about a year ago when we got to the point where we, okay, should be able to spend some time on this instead of other stuff. And okay, what's the problem? FQ Codel tends to fix the uh, buffer loop problem in as long as um, you've, um, in most cases, but why isn't it fixing it for wireless? What's different about wireless? Why, why, I mean, you can actually put FQ Codal on the wireless interface, but it's, and it, it improves things, but why is, why is there still bloat remaining? And how much bloat can vary a lot? It's hard to actually put a number on it. I think I could contrive a demonstration um, to get any numbers you want wanted there, but I'll, I'll show some numbers at the end. Anyway, um, so what, what, what really happened on the, and so this is when I quiz the room time and I th hope the rest of my talk would go a little bit faster, I've been a little slow getting into this. So the latency problem and the non-wireless drivers, you just replace the QDisk with FQ Codel and the problem's solved, right? Is that the whole story? Well, you already admitted that, that when you have a situation where it's not, it's not the link that you control uh, that has a buffer bolt problem. That's true. So but imagine you're at... It's just as simple as just turning it on. That's true. You have to turn it on at the bottleneck link, and I think I said that on a previous... You also care about reducing the size of the NIC uh, receiving transmit buffers. Yeah. And you also have to estimate, then, what is the... the BQL. Uh, yeah, BQL. Yeah, he's... <laughs> some people have heard of BQL. So, anyway, it turns out Wireless drivers aren't really that different. All drivers pull packets out of the Linux queue disk before it is time to actually transmit them for good reason. And this is true for especially high performance links, but the high performance links tend to be faster and perhaps aren't the bottleneck on your path. But anyway, the, if you don't pull enough packets out of the queue disk and hook them up to the DMA descriptors so the device can get busy, you run the risk of starvation and not fully utilizing the link that's there. So driver authors 
I believe, a lot of drivers, you can go and look at them where they actually have the constant number that's compiled into the driver, which is how many packets they're going to hook up to the DMA engine. And once they've done that many, that's enough. But why is that? I mean, and what, what does a driver author probably do before BQL and D? Um, you probably turn that up until you get all the performance you think you should and then leave it that high. But that might be large, a larger number than you actually need to achieve the performance. And by setting that number higher, what you're doing is committing to what order the packets are going to go out, the link. Instead of letting whatever fancy QDisk somebody has installed in the Linux traffic control, which is actually supposed to be what's deciding what gets to go next. But once it's come out of the QDisk, in some sense you've, you've given up on that ability to decide what, gets, what goes next. So anyway, um, um, So the, the solution to that second problem, which is how much, how many packets should be pulled out of the QDisk and go down into the driver, uh, is this thing called BQL and DQL. BQL is byte queue limits, and DQL is dynamic queue limits. DQL is a library. It's actually in a part of the kernel source tree. I hadn't spent much time looking at it. It's under lib. And there's an include file in include Linux called dynamic queue limits. And it's a very simple library that it will do this auto-tuning for you if you hook it up. And then in netdevice.h, I think it's entirely in the header file, there's this thing called BQL. And there's also a little bit of work that has to be done to individual device drivers to cut them over to use this. They have to report completions in a certain way into this system. And what the DQL library will do for you is it will, it will watch the system run in real time and automatically figure out how many packets do I actually have to commit down into the driver so that the driver never manages to complete all of them before I get the next packets in? In other words, any time the link, any time DQL sees that the, it went completely, I, everything got completed before the next thing got in, it goes, oh, we didn't put enough in. So at, at that point, it does an exponential increase, additive decrease, which is the opposite of most network control algorithms. It'll double, or something similar, the amount of packets it's willing to put down in order to avoid starvation. But it's only doubling. And then every time um, a certain amount of time goes by where we did not start the queue, it, um, it tries turning down in an additive sort of way, subtractive sort of way. So. Uh, oops, I think I'm going the wrong way. Oh, don't know which, okay. Okay. And I spent a lot of time looking in the wireless drivers in the Mac Eater 211 stack, which is sort of between the wireless drivers and the QDIS, trying to figure out what was going on. And I realized instead of like putting some hack down in the wireless drivers to solve this buffer bloat problem for wireless, what we really need to do is we need DQL hooked up to wireless. But DQL assumes that it's trying to find, it's trying to match the rate at which packets go out the interface to the system's ability to refill the transmit descriptors. And the trick, that what makes wireless different and not straightforward to just simply hook up uh, DQL to it in some way is the DQL is assuming that there's a rate it's trying to match. It's trying to find one thing. You know, how many bytes given how the responsiveness of my system to refill it. So maybe now that I've explained it this way, you all are about to have, maybe you, even before I move to the next slide, you're going to have the same idea I had in early December, which when I finally realized what I need to do. Oh, I'm, I've got another slide of setup here. This is, it, so what, what should we do for wireless? And I have had one key idea in early December and most of it's current. It's not that DQL is t t tuning the right number of bytes. It's that bytes, the way DQL works in normal, when, when BQL is normally hooked up to an interface, is that BQL, is that, is that bytes are a good proxy 
for an amount of time that the network device is going to be transmitting. And, and for devices that transmit at basically a single rate, you can use bytes as sort of a measure of time. And that's what's different about wireless. Bytes, looking at the length of a packet or a list of packets, does that give you an idea of how long it's going to take those packets to go out a wireless link? Yes, a very, very rough estimate, somewhere between milliseconds and microseconds. Yeah, some numbers, some few orders of magnitude range, exactly. <laughs> Good answer. So, so what should we do for wireless? And what I, the idea I had in December is like, oh, we really want to be using time. In other words, I, I want to take the, that list of packets and look at their lengths. And if, if it's a wireless driver that's using the Mac 802.11 um, rate control, then the packets are already decorated with a list of rates to, for the driver to try. And it's usually going to be the first rate that works because that's what the rate control prefers to use. So I just need to take the rate and the number of bytes in the packet and turn that to time. Well, it's not so simple. Figuring out mapping rates to, um, I'll, I'll get into some details anyway. So, oh, I guess that's, Yeah, so what are we going to, not actually these days, fewer and fewer drivers actually use Mac 802.11's rate control. Typically, rate control is now done down in a firmware blob. But that, that, I, don't, I, I don't think that actually matters at all. No. Because we already have feedback mechanisms that tell you what the rate, what the expected throughput is for a given issue. And everyone's expected to have those. Because you actually need those to implement Android. So to implement? Android. Android. Well, you're expected to advertise the expected bit rate on Android's UI, right? Oh, okay. So, no matter the rate. For an access point that has a, a whole bunch of associated clients. Yeah, but not, not, all well, and, not, not all Android drivers use, use Mac up to 11, though. Most don't. No, but that's what I'm saying, right? In order to implement the Android UI, so for those, you well, already need. This is great. I'm starting discussion. <laughs> I think I'm it's about not, a. It's not really relevant that, that they use or don't use Mac in the yeah, I have my parenthetic comment. If not, it is going to be complicated. It's not going to be that complicated. I think your point is that you can observe it, you don't have to control it. Right? Yeah, you, so you just have to observe the rate that's used, right. and you get that information. You can just watch the completions and look at how long the packets were, and that'll give you a, a hint. Not at all. Well, well, I think you get a richer set of information than even that. I mean, here's, here's why I think it's a little bit difficult and complicated, because imagine you have a long list of packets to a whole bunch of Clients. I'm actually thinking from about the point of view of an access point sure. that's okay. got a, dozens of associated clients mm -hmm. and it's a saturated access point. What can we do in that case? Well, in that case, you hand a whole bunch of packets down to a firmware blob that's going to do rate control separately for each of the dis ind individual right, destinations. It's going to tell you what bit rate it picked for each station in, some, in one the way or another. Maybe some firmware. at completion time, so you use it for the next packet, or you, know, you get out of band information when it changes. Yeah, we should talk. I, this is not the biggest problem. Okay. Just think about sniffer mode. You have to report the... No, this is ARGs. That's different. It's a completely different situation. Yeah, ARGs are. I'm about to declare success since I've started discussion in the room. Anyway. <laughs> but the so, more interesting problem isn't also starving the transmitter's DMA engine. It's filling your aggregations to have enough... Yeah. To actually get... I think I... That, that, my that second that's, paragraph, mapping from linked rate info to expected time will need to be aware of aggregation either explicitly or via some guesstimate. I'm trying to... In the case of Athline K, which is the thing I'm playing with at the moment, it, that's done in software and it uses Mac 812 and rate it's control. It's than with other devices that do it in the hardware, right? Yeah, it, it, but it's still... <laughs> I'm, I'm in sort of in the middle. Anyway, um, also DQL doesn't... I, I'm not aware of any um, thoughts about how DQL, how the DQL library works in a multi-queue situation where you're actually using all of the queues. And at least some people tend to think that, I mean, I haven't seen it in action, but some people seem to think that for wireless, the, the multi-queue is more important than the multi-queue and wired drivers for some we reason. We never got it working very well in the multi-queue on, on, on wired. 
DQL. I'm not. I haven't seen any code that even suggests that it tries to do anything other than be very stupid. It doesn't do anything, right? Anyway, so that's where I am. Okay, so what's happening? There's a new intermediate transmit queues in Mac 802.11 that they landed last spring in mainline Linux. And um, in my mainline Linux kernel, at least as far as I can tell, there are no drivers in the tree that actually use these intermediate queues. But there is an out of tree driver MT76, which does. And I went and looked at that and tried to figure out what's going on. It's like, wow, would the, does switching to these intermediate queues actually going to help me here? And it actually doesn't make any difference at all, except it changes things around, which I think is going to make it easier to do something. Um, the, the key thing is, is that this question currently, it, before this intermediate queues, it's actually down in each driver. There's something which decides how much to pull out of the Linux queue disk and do something. Whereas this intermediate queue, the, the code that decides where, when to stop doing that is actually in Mac 11 which means if we do it there, uh, perhaps the code can be shared from multiple drivers. And uh, I didn't, I tried to figure out how to get a hold of an MT76 hardware and couldn't figure out how to do that. Um, so I said, oh, I'll just cut F9K over. That took some doing. I learned a lot more about the internals of the F9K driver than I really wanted to. But I believe I have working patch. I'll get to that in a moment. Yeah, I said that on this side. I have this patch, and um, it seems to be working. And I think it's probably going to be a good idea to cut other drivers over, but I guess that'll be up to those drivers' maintainers. Um, now, to actually get towards solving the problem, I have a very, I have a crude kludge patch, which is supposed to enable me to do some demos before I came and spoke with you all today. And I've written it, and it looks like it ought to do thing. It's not that many lines of code. Um, um, and it's actually kind of crude. I just wanted DQL to be working in my demo, and in my demo where basically there are just two, two stations running at two different rates, and only one of them is actually congesting the queue. I don't even have to get the length of the pack, or I don't even have to get the rates right. I just took the length and multiplied it by a constant and threw it in DQL. But uh, even, this pa uh, even this simple patch uh, is not working, and I was even still scratching my head last night trying to figure, see if I could figure it out. But any day now, I think I should at least have a demo which would make some of the numbers I show later. Um, but this was just a, supposed to be a stepping stone um, towards figuring out what the right thing to do is. And so what I can demo, just to give you an idea, sort of the, what I'm looking at in my test bed as far as a sort of first case to try to do it. I have an access point and two associated client stations. I've turned the power down to three milliwatts on the AP to make things more interesting, getting to the client, associated client in the next room. Uh, I have the first client sitting right next to the access point on the table, and the other one's in the next room about 10, minute, 10 meters away. What I'm doing is I'm, from the nearby associated client, I'm pinging the access point, and from the uh, access point in the other room, I start a bulk download. Ah, and, um, and that bulks up the queue, that, that associated client, the rate control is turning the rate way down in order to get the packets with such low power into the next room. And I start up the bulk flow after about five seconds of pinging, and you can see the <coughs> queue's loading up, no surprise. Well, actually... It's not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I did the same actually, you could go up to two and a half seconds. Yeah, if you, if, you, if you let this run longer, it can, you can get saved. But actually, I didn't install FQCODA there. FQCODA helps on the wireless link. And I'll just rerun that same experiment with FQCODA. And you can see, I guess this is why they want me to stay near the microphone. You can see um, in the right-hand column of milliseconds, the ping times. I mean, there's some over 50, 33. I've seen runs where there were actually quite a few in the 50 to 65 range millisecond. So FQ Codel is definitely worth still installing. So if you have a wireless interface that is your bottleneck, don't just give up. Go ahead and, and switch to FQ Codel. And um, 
and I've switched over to the intermediate queues and I can rerun it and I get basically the same numbers. They look like they're a little smaller here. There's a 51 millisecond on there. Um, no real improvement by switching to the intermediate queues, but the next patch, which is a change to the way the intermediate queues work, uh, my goal is I think I can get all of these into the single digit milliseconds and maybe if things go really well down around six or seven milliseconds. It seems like four uh, milliseconds. Um, my goal is for it not to, and I'm, I'm not that far along yeah, okay. yet. Of course, I would want that. So, thanks for listening. Please feel free to try to unconfuse me any further. I feel like I made a step function less confused in early December. I feel like I might be working on the right problem now. Um, and I'll be here through Friday, and, um, I should, thanks, Andrew McGregor, as I told at the beginning of the talk, is the one who started me on this path, and he still listens to me. Avery listens to me <laughs> multiple times per week, uh, as we've, we've talked about other stuff as well. But, um, and I thank uh, Andrew and Avery for figuring out how to make it possible for me to work on this for a while. And I think I'm out of time now. <laughs>